I think the best piece of advice is, yeah, communication. Communication, setting goals, setting time frames, and working in advance. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast brought to you by Indopreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. I'm so excited to be here with you today to talk a lot about music marketing. And we have a really special guest with us today. I'm your host, Jack McCarthy. With me, as always, is my awesome co-host, Circa. And today, like I said, we have a really special guest joining us for the show, Rachel Strasberger. She's an artist manager. She manages Black Eyed Peas and has a really cool story with some great insights and advice to give to artists about a recent growth phase that the group went through. Rachel, thanks so much for being here on Creative Juice. So happy to have you today. Thank you. Thank you, guys, and thank you for having me. This is great, and I'm very, I'm actually even a bit nervous. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, well, we have a pretty welcoming audience. I'm sure they're just as stoked to listen to the stories and the advice and insight that you have to share. But just to kind of kick things off, I'd love to get to know you and let our listeners get to know you and, and share a little bit about who you are, what you've been up to, and how you found yourself here today, both in the music business and, and talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 uh, do we have like an hour for me to do the presentation? No. Okay. <laughs> so, so um, I've, been, I've been around for a, a long time, actually. I started completely by chance i used to say by mistake but it's it, it's it wasn't a mistake because it, because it was just meant to be right uh, so i initially come from commercial legal background started really by chance because i had a boyfriend that was a dj so i started helping out in a club but that was like in the 90s and then from there i worked in a record label and did marketing and back then record labels were doing cds and vinyls there was no streaming or the, the the it was the beginning of the streaming in more like downloading with pirate bays and and all of them so so that was like end of 90s beginning of the 2000s and then from there i continued in the music industry within the legal side of labels and then from there i went into management stayed into management for a couple of years and left management went into consultancy which I opened my own little boutique service company that is called Strasburger because I didn't really have a better name to call it. So, <laughs> I don't know how to call it except for my surname. So that's not very creative. I would have needed a bit of creative juice in, into that one. Uh, <laughs> and then from there, continued in the consultancy branch just because I really enjoyed the fact of getting into a project, helping the project, you know, pick up and and get out there and then at that point move on to the next project and in 2020 I was approached by now my client slash boss Paula Molina which we had co-managed some art DJs prior to him reaching out to me in 2020 and uh, and he asked me if I wanted to be part of the Black Eyed Peas management team which I said yes (laughs) Wow, that's quite a 360 kind of career, like sort of getting your hands in all areas of of music and what's going on in the industry from label stuff to legal stuff to marketing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's really why and where I can help out in the consultancy, because when when I consult, we consult for, 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 I have a little team of four people. We consult to labels, but we also consult to music managers or sometimes even to artists themselves. And, and, coming from this very broad background where I was a manager, I was a label, I was a a marketing and promotion agent, I was a booker. So I know what what an actual club needs to, you know, know, so basically I did it most all. And, and, And that really helps to be like, okay, so let's connect the dots. Let's connect the record together with the touring, together with the marketing, together with your getting some money from your author's rights and your performing rights. So all of that really goes really well within the whole consultancy nutshell of helping out from an electronic music artist to a Black Eyed Peas mainstream artist. 
Yeah, that's really fascinating. I'm curious to hear, you know, since starting to work with the Black Eyed Peas, I know that you were really heavily involved in the release strategy and the marketing and, and really, it sounds like many areas around the last two records. I'm curious where you found yourself as far as the role goes for for those albums, you know, of those areas that you've worked in and spent so much time in, where have you found yourself the most dialed in these days? Well, first off, behind the scenes. So you will not see me in front of cameras apart from today, but generally very much behind the scenes. And um, I, my role is to connect dots. My role is to make sure that when a, a track is going to be coming out, we roll it out properly. So where I first started in the music industry, we would start rolling out six months prior because back then there was CDs. So we actually had to go and manufacture the CDs. We had to stock the CDs and sell the CDs. So, so I come from this perspective that you need to line things up in the best way possible, tick all those boxes that you can tick so that you hopefully get the best success out of, of your music and out of your art. So I never really am involved in the creative aspect, except for when we did the remixes. But I would really be the very pragmatic and strategic person that will roll out. Be like, okay, we have the masters, tick. We have the legal, tick. Okay, let's start from there. What are we doing? Where are we doing? What is our target? Which which side of the world or which countries do we want to target? How do we target them? Who do we have on the ground that will help us in each and every important country? So even though we have one major label, which is in our Black Eyed Peas case, Epic with Sony, we still will have people on the ground making sure that each territory is covered in a specific cultural coverage in a language because when when the major label will send out information they'll send it out in english but the italians or the spanish or the germans or the french in europe typically won't necessarily want to send those that that information out in english they will have to translate it and if they have a lot of tracks coming out and a lot of priority acts, uh, artists, talents, they don't have time to translate it. So we'll make sure that all those boxes are ticked and we make sure that they really have everything that they, they need to make the track a success. So a lot of really getting like the strategic ducks in a row, a, a lot of the nerdy stuff that we talk about on this show, <laughs> I think that that's super interesting. And I'm, I'm really curious to hear more from when it came to marketing and, and really like strategic planning and marketing rollout for translation and elevation with a group like Black Eyed Peas, where, you know, they're a, a massive group with tons of audience around the world, tons of fans. There's so much opportunity to leverage growth. What kind of brought you to the place of seeing the opportunities that you did as far as tapping into different markets. I know that there was a big emphasis on the Latin markets and there were collaborations going on with those records. What kind of events leading up to that kind of pointed light in that direction? And then where did you guys take it as far as trying to attack that strategically? Well, like, for example, let's, let's, take, let's take one example. Let's take Don't You Worry. Don't You Worry was a track with Shakira and David Guetta. So we knew we were going to be releasing a track with two major artists that have two very distinct targets. David Guetta, even though he's pop, he's broad, but he still is EDM. He'll still be doing events. He'll still be doing club gigs. So we wanted to, for example, only for David Guetta, we wanted to make sure that he would be able to support the track. For him to support the track, he wasn't able to, well, he wouldn't have been able to support the version of the track that we would have had on Spotify. He would have needed a more clubby version that he would have supported. 
And he would have, and depending also of where he was playing, if he was playing at a big main mainstream festival rather than a more cooler Ushuaia type of club in Ibiza, for example. So we would need to give all the tools like to David Get Out to make sure that he would promote it. But then let's, let's talk about Shakira. Shakira would have a huge fan base and has a, a huge fan base community out there. So we would reach out to them or we would reach out to their fan base and make sure that we would give them specific assets. We would make sure that they would, we would give them content to share at a specific time, at a specific language, in a specific way. So all of this is just like a really small example of one track that we, we had two very distinct collaborations that we were giving content to them so that they would be able to support the track. So when you say content, right, like if I'm just in the example you gave, right, we have a track, you want to get it wider distribution by broadening out uh, the location base of it, right? So not just in this territory, but like what artists, when it comes to actually coordinating the features on the track, your strategy is like, I'm going to pick specific artists to broaden the territory, right? Yes, territory, and not only territory in terms of geography, but also like target territory. David Guetta will play in a, in a commercial place and will play in a super underground place. Oh, yeah. We, we, for example, with Don't You Worry, like France. In France, we're on Energy Radio, which is a very commercial radio, but we're also on FG, which is a more electronic radio. And now we're even in Sky Rock, which is actually a sort of more rock hip hop ish type of radio but we're still there so it's it, but then we might be on that on those radios with three different versions so those are assets contents different type of contents that we would give based on the targets that we are looking to reach so yeah so really like artists become in that instance artists become a platform where you can get access to the types of fans that you're not hitting through your your built-in sort of demo, you can now, j just like we go to Facebook to buy, you know, traffic, buy users, you can go to an artist who has a large platform already and, and buy that user base by just getting them as a feature. Absolutely. But then we also need to make sure that the artist is happy with the product with the right, music right. Sure. and that will actually really support it and believe it in it, in it and 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 you know that's also another very challenging thing because very often big acts big artists their management makes sure that they have collaborative artists that do a collab but then there's no actual collaboration. There's no social posts. There's no likes on, on social. There's no, there's no real interaction, right. you know? And I think that is also something extremely important because sometimes the artist had that interaction when they did the music, but then the teams don't actually go and do the interaction. The teams don't go and, and knock at those doors. Coordinate. They don't, they need to coordinate it. Um, that's so cool. Cause like we we're very digital marketer focused. So we're very nerdy. We're looking at platforms and we're like, we're like literally clicking buttons and filling out fields. But you know, I can abstract that out to what you do and say like, okay, well you want to broaden the base for this artist. So your medium of communication, how you, your language of marketing it plays out in this specific instance in this domain where it's like, I will select artists where I already have that. I, you know, they already have access to the audience that I want, just like, you know, a, a different like media might have access to the user you want. So that's how you're selecting like, okay, we can broaden it out with this artist, but then if you don't have that coordination on the release front, then it's all for naught because it's, it's, you know, it's subpar, but so you have to tightly coordinate that. And w when you said content, is that video content? So you're making sure everything, everything, okay, everything, cool. everything. It could be video content, be the audio content. It could be the actual, like I said, mixes, different mixes based on the different territories. Uh, it, it could all these, like all the uh, when we're saying assets, all the assets that we're giving out to fan clubs because we made specific 
territory assets where when we were promoting the single we were sending it to the fan club of Shakira in I don't know Brazil we would make sure that on, on that asset we would have a Brazilian flag you know we would make that content specifically for the Brazilian uh, fan base. We would make a whole other content for the Portuguese, the, the from Portugal, uh, the Spaniard, etc., etc., etc. So that means translating assets. That means creating those assets and dispatching them at the right time, at the right moment to the right people that want to play ball and make it a success. That's super fascinating to me. And I think that this is insightful, especially for artist managers and teams, because it, it, when you look out there at, you know, music collaborations in the wild, even from the perspective of a fan, like Cirque was saying, and like you were saying, it often, it looks from an outside perspective, oftentimes when an artist or two artists or three artists do a collaboration together and maybe a feature it's the music and maybe the music video, if you're lucky, and then you never hear anything more about it from there. And I think from what you're mentioning about the Black Eyed Peas and what you guys did with, you know, just in this, just in these, this one example, the amount of effort and strategic planning and, you know, time and care to care to detail and attention to detail, that really is what takes it from being something that goes as like an oversight to fans to something actually, you know, tangible and meaningful and seems like it matters, you know, like it creates like small moments for a fan that add up and actually allow an artist to then tap into a different market and get in front of a different audience in a way that means something. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think it's also about, you know, we care that we, we did with, with our, we have, uh, we have our P bodies that are basically the fans of Black Eyed Peas. And we give them uh, a premiere of the video. Uh, normally, the video comes out on a Friday. And generally, on the Wednesday, we have this huge Zoom meeting where we have everyone and we'll show the video to them in avant premiere, which is something that normally other, I know that other collaborative artists, when I was asking them if we would do that with their fan clubs, they were like, no, they're going to leak. And I'm like, Huh. Wait, wait, wait. How do you have, so you have the Peabody's? Is that what you said? Yeah. Uh, wh how are they aggregated? So like, how does one become a Peabody? Is it a form on a website? Like, where does that come from? So they have their own thing, which I, we try to not get too involved because it's really something that we want to keep organic. So when I first came on board and we were, uh, I, I just came and it was, we were finishing the rollout of translation and at that, well, Translation already had come out, but we were still doing Girl Like Me. We did a couple of singles. I did those singles for Translation. So every second, I think it was Wednesdays, we would have the Peabody calls where we would have a Zoom where once in a while Taboo would jump in, Apple would jump in, Will would jump in, and would just come in and say hi to the Peabodies. We would just chit chat about general things when we're doing the next shows and when the releases are coming out so it's just very passionate fans that we spend time and we know for many many years some of some of them are peabody's for like 20 years there's like pictures of them with the peas they know they know better black eyed peas than i do because they've been they've been black eyed P club for 20 years. So, so I, we have, for example, one of the, uh, well, two of the Peabody's, Manar, for example, Manar is our researchist. So she is officially a Peabody. She's based out of, she's in somewhere in the Middle East. Would I have any type of questions as in, we're doing the anniversary of that or that or that. Can you go and grab whatever content? She'll go and look on YouTube or, and, and find all these like super old, pieces of content that have been there for 10, 15 years that nobody even knew that they were there. And she goes and finds them and brings this to us. So it's this community type of work. Like your archivist. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> And, and and then very often we get like typically uh, it was her birthday while we were on tour and Taboo did a special shout out as in Manar, happy birthday. Thank you for being there. And she had sent through the other Peabody's uh, a car that she drew because she's a very talented artist. So, yeah, so that we have this very strong relationship with our Peabody's. That's so cool. Like we do a lot of studying, you know, sort of what 
larger acts are doing and try to measure that up against like what we try to do for our clients. Like try to understand like, you know, what's the standard operating procedure across the industry and how well are people keeping these tight loops, these feedback loops. And Jack just did a study, which we recently did an episode on of like the billboard hot 100. He went to, to all their websites, signed up for all any opt-in form to sign up for something. He did all of it and kept track of everything. And the follow-up was just not there. Like so many people collecting email addresses, but then doing nothing with them. So that's why it made me curious is like, oh, it seems like you guys have some method of gathering super fans, meeting with them on a regular basis, which is something we just don't see a lot in the industry. Like, True, true, true. But this is also, this is definitely something that typically on our projects that we were doing on electronic music, we would, this like this is a very marketing example. So we would be working a single. We would see where the artist, often a DJ, would, would perform. On the contract, the DJ would have, 10, 15, 20 entrance guest lists, right? So we would make sure, like we did this for some field on, on, on the last singles we worked for some field through for, for spinning. And, uh, he did, he did a couple of events. I think it was in Germany. So what we would do is that we'd be like, we would reach out to the festival. We would ask them if they had a media partner. If they did not have a media partner, we would reach out to some cool radios in that specific area we would reach out to the radio and say listen we want to give away five tickets for a meet and greet with some failed this is the latest single are you interested in playing this latest single if the radio would be like yeah sure the radio the, the single is cool why not give away so we would give away these tickets we would have the fans call the radio so that's the first interaction that the radio would have get the meet and greet well get the ticket to go and, and to the festival go and see some felt and have a lovely evening, get away with a t-shirt probably because you would get a piece of merch or something, meet the artist and be happy. And, and at the same time, the artist would have had maybe potentially a new fan, radio play, and, and a buzz around his name and, and, his, and his performance at that specific festival. Very cool. Yeah, so really tying it kind of all together. It's, it's all really interesting and and something you said, Rachel, that I want to learn a little bit more about from from your end, especially at, at such a high level in the industry. What are some of the challenges that you've seen? Like you mentioned, for example, the Zooms that you guys do with the Peabody's and you know, releasing the music videos a little earlier and trying to negotiate that and navigate that with other artist managers or teams. I'm curious, what are, what are some of the other challenges that you've come across, especially in recent years with the Peas, for example, and a lot of these collaborations, what are some of the challenges and maybe some insights that you could share with other artist managers about navigating that? Because it's, it's, you know, there's minds out there. <laughs> there is. And, 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 and like typically the fan club community is sometimes really tricky because we've had we've had the possibility of working with other big acts that had very big communities, which they are not as interactive and proactive as we are because within the communities, not everyone treats each other fairly. So there's like jealousy of, oh, that community got entrances or that one. So then it's very difficult for the artist manager to put all of these communities on a Zoom call without having dramas, you know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. To say the least, <laughs> we 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 are lucky. We have we have very peaceful Peabodies, and so that for us was has has never really been an issue. But then I understand that more the fan communities are engaged, the more it could happen that there might be some little problems between each other, you know, within the communities. Right. Okay, so en- engaged communities create maybe a little bit of clickiness. Exactly, because then I, I heard of, from some that to enter, to answer your questions yeah, of, of earlier, some communities have actual questionnaires, as in you need to fill in, you need to know Black Eyed Peas so, before you're actually part of this community. So they they would give like tests, which single did they first come out with, which album they cover, this <laughs> single, which part of the, you know, like an actual like exam. So so I've heard that this happens. We're not really into it, but yeah. Are, are you mainly, so you're referring to 
fan communities that are self-governed, self-created? Yes. Okay, okay. That's interesting because, yeah, like we don't see a whole lot of effort from sort of the bigger acts in the industry to have their own like fan database and be like, you know, for instance, like with email marketing, with text marketing, we find those things to be like a little bit slap slapdash. And maybe that's because it's hard to set these standards top down from like the management team and the, and the group, but to then be able to reach out to the leaders of these self-formed communities and activate them is like a nice sort of like compromise. It is. But, but like typically we are still working on our newsletter, email gathering, et cetera, et cetera. This is something that we've start like we've working on pretty intensively in the past six, seven months. But before that, we're not really good at that. So we had our community uh, where we would do our Zooms and each head of each community would then dispatch to two, three, four, five, six hundred people within the community, within each country. We're still really working on on the whole newsletter, etc. But the, the, the tapping into communities, this is something that very often I've noticed that management's don't necessarily do because even on the consultancy side when we were checking out and doing the background check of the of the artist and seeing what could be used to do the best job possible obviously the community is an absolute asset to use and not many actually even knew that the communities existed we were doing the background check and checking on instagram and on facebook and finding these fan clubs and reaching out to them but management never even had talked to them. It's, it seems to be the culture in the industry up until this point that like, I've always thought of the, like, especially when you get higher up into the industry, you start talking to folks where like the primary goal is not to necessarily group all the fan data to have a tight loop of like, how many fans do I have in this state that have registered with me or so on and so forth. It's more about impressing and sort of uh, maintaining relationships with decision makers, like for a playlist or for a radio station or that, you know, this and that. And so it's refreshing to see that focus on, on activating fans and having a tight understanding of like, where are all our fan communities and, you know, how do we contact them? Like that's, that's super cool. But then on another note, because you were talking about the fact that you guys were giggies and you liked your data, which that is something that I adore. And I don't like thinking that, I mean, things happen by, by chance, but it's best if you actually make them happen. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah. And then sometimes things really happen organically. And then you need to understand the why they happen organically. That's, that's my big everyday challenge. So we work a lot, for example, with Shazam and we will check the Shazams because the, Shaz the beautiful, the beautiful thing of Shazam is that nobody really care about Shazam. Nobody will. Will, will fake Shazams. Nobody's going to, there's no bots in Shazams. Or, or just, it's not being gamed like every other metric. <laughs> exactly. So, so but, but still, Shazam still means that somebody took the time to take his phone and check the music. That means that there is a true interest in that you know, music and from that specific person. So it uh, very often we check what happens in Shazam. And if suddenly we have a peak in Shazam in Paris, or well, Paris is, is a big city, but still Paris will be like, why? Why do we have a peak in, in Paris? Let's check it out. Oh, because this radio now just is supporting us. Or because in this festival, if it's electronic music, in this festival, this DJ played it and all these people have shazammed it. Or because, and at that point, that triggers something that needs to be done. If it's a radio that happens, and that I would say more for, not for Black Eyed Peas, but more for our electronic clients, if something happens on a radio anywhere in the world and we see a peak in Shazam, we will reach out to the radio and we will offer a liner. And we'll be like, hey, we saw you played the track. Thank you so much for supporting us. Here, do would you like a track of DJ blah, blah, blah saying, thank you so much for supporting my track? Because if that radio organically played the track, for sure, once they get a liner, once they get appreciation, they will support it more. Right. That's interesting and kind of comes back to something you mentioned at the at the top of our conversation about how you kind of view yourself as the connector of the dots. And it sounds like a lot of this work 
whether it be strategically planning releases or just looking for marketing opportunities for your clients is so heavily based on let's look at the data that we can find, let's connect the dots and then make decisions based on that. Absolutely, 100%. And then try to predict the unpredictable. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and try to influence the the very difficult part of influencing people and, and bringing them. There's so much music out there. There's so much... There's so much happening that if the only way to 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 bring something forward is to connect those dots, is to tick all those boxes, is to try to dispatch in the best way possible with all our today's tools. We have so many incredible technological tools to monitor things, to reach out to people, to analyze things. What we do as an agency is a lot of like we build systems that are sort of purpose built for coordination like that. So we build out email marketing, offers to get on the email list, tagging structures, all this stuff to just keep a tight coordination. And it seems like a lot of what, what you're ending up doing is is mining coordination out of uncoordinated systems. You're going in and trying to find out how can we start to organize this? Absolutely. 100%. Yeah, that's exactly the very good. I, I need to actually quote you on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's super cool. It's 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 interesting to hear cuz you know, we're we're often like off in our own siloed corner of things and it's just cool to hear how we end up looking for the same results in in different ways. That's super cool. Yeah. Yeah, I love this so much. Rachel, I I would love to hear if if you'd offer a few pieces of advice, specifically for artist managers, I think, who might be in similar situations as you, that you find yourself in, especially when it comes to like coordinating collaboration, man, say that five times fast, um, <laughs> coordinating that kind of collaboration and working through putting together a strategy that actually makes an impact. I know you've mentioned like, make sure that the artists that you're collaborating with have assets that they need, which is just a, a, such an easy, low-hanging fruit one. But I would love to hear advice that you'd have for, for artist managers and for artists and bands as well. But I think especially for the managers that are working behind the scenes on connecting the dots like you. Well, I mean, I think everything starts by a spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. Speaking my language here. <laughs> start by, with a spreadsheet where, where literally on the spreadsheet, you'll have who are all the actors. The label is an actor. The management are the actors. The artists are the actors. The fan bases are the actors. The, the labels are the actors because often we think as a one big label, but at the end of the day, each country has its label. Each country has its culture. So that is also a lot of coordinating. I don't want to use the trust word in, in the wrong way, but don't trust that your label based out of the US is going to do a great job into Europe or in Asia or in Australia. Because those same label people that are in Europe or in Asia or in Australia have so much what is called domestic catalog they have so much product that they will anyway be be working music they'll be working on so i think again spreadsheet coordinating things and making sure that we have all those actors and who will do what at what time and how and i think the best piece of advice is yeah communication communication setting goals setting time frames and working in advance yeah if there was one thing, because I'm sure like as you've come up into more of like a sort of like jack of all trades role, right? Because you, you've done some management, you've done some promotion and marketing, you've done, you know, some some touring work and stuff like that. So now that you sort of like sit and oversee all of these things or at least have a vantage point to understand them, what's something that you see that's like prevalent? behavior in the industry that you see as like a missed opportunity or or an inefficiency that you try to like, like what's something that, you know, as soon as you start working with an act, like you're checking these things to make sure they have them? Well, there's many of them, but the most thing that is always very frustrating is we have to release tomorrow. We have to release next week. Yeah, like yeah. this urgency of having to release 
so quickly. Yeah. Why? Oh, speaking my language. <laughs> That's already the biggest missed opportunity because if you don't have the time to start looking at the big picture of looking at what you want to be uh, reaching out to and how you... Assets. Cutting assets for each specific territory. Cutting like, like, uh, like visual assets. That takes time. Yeah, like you, you might see a piece of content that's supposed to support a single that's just one piece. And you're like, this could be 80 pieces. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like you, you see, there's a video. Yeah, great video. I mean, fabulous. But people want to see BTS. They want to see behind the scenes of the video. They want to see like what, what worked a lot, what we did a lot with, uh, with Girl Like Me. We did a lot of effects on the video. We managed to... I will, I don't want to say drag, but yeah, we did drag the content, but it was all very different content. And all of that content still brought people to consume and to listen to the specific song, right? And so we had uh, the before and after pictures, like before the edit or the, the, the post production and the after post production. So all of that, that, those assets are extra assets are extra content that brings and 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 keeps the product or the song sorry the song alive in a nice non salesy way because people want to see the before and after they want to see the the f people laughing behind when they're filming and they want to see all of that yeah such a big part of marketing is finding excuses to talk about the thing you're supposed to talk about <laughs> But but then it should not all be all salesy. It could also be human. It could be it could be something that you you feel you feel passionate about, you know. And and I think that's also something which sometimes it depends also on, on the artist. And and I think that younger artists might feel this is more something natural to them to to be so socially involved and and think socially of what people want to see rather than maybe older uh, artists still have a bit of a, it has to be polished content, uh, produced content, and sometimes a polished, produced content just doesn't perform. Yeah. Yeah, we found the more polished and more produced, the worse it performs. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The, and especially in today's era where all of the platforms are tended towards disposable content. Where it's like you could spend weeks creating this, but one, if it doesn't work, like you need to have something else, and two, like you're gonna know if it doesn't work in a day cycle. So you have like it's just, and, and then after that day, like you can repurpose it and recycle it, but it's like it's so disposable that it's like it's not useful to you after like two, three days after release, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's such a good, concise way of putting why, l like you were saying, Rachel, about like, why is there so much urgency to get something out tomorrow to get something out next week when there's so much work to be done in putting assets together that you can keep using over time? Why rush? No, exactly. And then not only you can use them over time, but you can dispatch them in in a broader way. If you, if you take the time to reach out to the fans, the thing, the label, we also, we actually prepped super, super produced content for labels in each territory for them to announce the single. Because we knew that the label was not necessarily going to announce the singles, but if they already have the asset there, their social media team will just upload it and boom, it's there. You know? <laughs> if I make it just a button press for you. Will you do it? <laughs> yeah. But it's also interesting to think about, like, because we think about content variants, like, we will say, okay, you have a single. Likely the case is that there's a 30 second clip within that single that's like your best foot forward on all fronts. If you find that clip, then we have like variants. It's like different tries at that video content. But then, like, adding your perspective onto it, it's like, all right, we have Brazil territory. So we need to uh, translate these captions to Portuguese, right? We need, we, we have like all these different territories. So captions need to be translated. Copy needs to be translated. Elements of their culture, if they can be worked in, need to be worked in. And so then you end up with like this 
combinatorial explosion of different things you could do to make more, you know, give more life to this single. I think that's super cool and eye opening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, and, and even like uh, reaching out because w for us, the dancing is is a big part of Black Eyed Peas. You know, they started as dancers and uh, as b-boys. And so dancing is something very important. Like Taboo has uh, this this YouTube series called Freestyle Session, uh, where he goes to to, to dancers and, and, and he, he wants to understand their culture and how and why and, and how they learned and et cetera, et cetera. So when we're on tour, we were in Egypt, we went and, and saw some dancers. When we were in Israel, we went and saw some dancers in France, et cetera, et cetera. And, but typically, all these people are still our connections, right? So what we also did with them was when we knew that we were going to be releasing a single in the next weeks, we would reach out to them and be like, hey, would you want to dance in front of the pyramids with our music and do something a bit special? You know, and that's all that outreaching. And that is content also, which, as you, say, you were mentioning before, it's still very specific, territory specific, culturally specific, but... The French would love seeing people dancing in front of pyramids too. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So you did this release and then tour with the with the peas. What what is sort of next for you? Like what are you working on right now? Normally there's always one person from management that tours with them. So we as we're three in the team, we split management touring duties i'll be going to mexico in at the end of the month i've never been i'm actually really excited of that yeah, yeah, and uh, awesome. and also really excited of shooting specific behind the scene content with taboo because he was indigenous mexican people while we're in mexico so we have all of these like side projects while touring and what is next well i am hoping a next album for black eyed peas yeah, that rocks. It's that, that would be that would be fun. That would really be fun. So it's it's something that is is being worked on. As I said, I am never part of the creative uh, of the creative part of it. I just feel not creative enough. And I think with all these incredible creatives between Will, Apple, and Taboo, they'll do an incredible job. So I'm very, very, very excited to see the results. Well, hear the results. I'm really excited to kind of follow your journey a little bit to Rachel, especially like as you're going on the road, you know, chatting with you today was so amazing because I think for a group like Black Eyed Peas, for fans and artists and musicians and people in the music industry, you don't often get a look behind the curtain, you know, like we kind of got here today. So for one, thank you for sharing everything that you shared. It's been incredibly insightful and just a lot of fun um, to get sort of that background insight. Um, but I think it'll be especially cool to see what's up in the next coming months and sort of have this lens to look at it all through. So I'm, I'm curious, like, where can people follow what's going on in Black Eyed Peas world, in your world? And, you know, would love to have you back on the show when it comes time for the next record to uh, see what dots you're connecting there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Black Eyed Peas, definitely, uh, we will, I make it my mission to make sure that on Instagram, there is as much content as possible for Black Eyed Peas. My journey, I am so bad at promoting <laughs> myself. <laughs> you need to start a vlog or a podcast. I am terrible at promoting myself. I was actually speaking to this uh, with Paulo yesterday where he was mentioning that uh, he had hired a social media team to make sure that uh, the, the grassroots website was, or well, grassroots socials was, was done properly. And and I'm like, yeah, that's good. You should do that. And, and he looks at mine and he's like, Rachel, you have three posts in a whole year. How <laughs> How can you be giving <laughs> advices here? You, you, you last post was in May. And yeah, so I am very bad, but I have decided I will work on my social media presence. I will. <laughs> 
but looking forward to keeping up with it for sure. And looking forward to seeing what you guys do in Black Eyed Peas world as well. Thanks again for joining us. This was so much fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Super cool insights. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed these insights. Thanks again, Rachel, for joining us today. Keep up with what the Black Eyed Peas are up to on the road and with all of their upcoming releases. And we'll see you guys next time on Creative Juice. As we're wrapping up the show here, you're listening to Something That I Need to Know by Corey Lewin, one of our Indie Awards winners. Check out Corey. We'll leave a link in the show notes to his music. We'll catch you guys next time. Peace out, Indies. I'm feeling something that I can't explain. I want to reach into your soul and take away your pain. You're giving up and I thought I had to, but you put your faith in me and I believed in you. I felt for you on the north end of a place I've never been. The air was cold and I just wanted to hold you tight. Laying awake till we saw the morning light. And as the sunlight crept up on your window, I twirled your hair in your ear. I whispered low, I want you, baby, but let's take it slow. Because there's something that I need to know. And I never want to be the one who'd hurt you. Know about all of the shit you've been